Hello everyone, and welcome back to Brussels Movie Reviews, the show where I review stuff that's mostly pretty good, maybe one of the best movies of all time, or a film that absolutely sucks if you're in the depths of hell. Now, real quick, I just want to mention before we get on with the review itself, sorry this didn't get uploaded yesterday on Halloween. Basically, I was, you know, I only got the, the Halloween 5 review done, or I got it done earlier in the day, but it didn't finish exporting until like 8 and wasn't able to upload until obviously like 10. So I just decided, you know, not to really deal with it and decided to push it back till today. So sorry about that one. And obviously, you could tell this is going to be a longer video, kind of like the Alien 3 review, because like the Alien 3 review, I have two versions of the film I'm going to have to discuss the, uh, the theatrical cut of Halloween 6 and the producer's cut. So, yeah, this is going to be a long one, but enough dawdling, and also, if you hear me coughing every once in a while, I'm sorry, I just have a really bad sore throat, so if you hear me coughing, that's a why, so I just want to stress that right now. Anyway, let's get on with, with the review. So this was uh, made with a budget of around six million dollars domestically it made about 15 million and uh it hasn't been confirmed world uh, how, how much it made worldwide but it was pretty meh at the box office and this was released on september 29th of 1995 and this was directed by a guy named joe Ch uh chappelle and I never really heard of this guy before, kind of like Dominique uh, from the last film. So, yeah, it was not looking well for this one. And obviously, <clears throat> like, you know, kind of like the Alien 3 review, this one has a, a bit of history with it. So, I'm not going to go in too much into depth like I did in the Alien 3 one, since I don't really know much about the production of the film itself. But if you want to know more about it, I will leave a link down in the description below to a video where basically it goes majorly in depth about it. But um, I'll go into it a little bit in this video. So well, before we get to that, let's get on with my history with the film and the plot itself. So. Michael Myers played in this film by a returning George P. Wilbur, for the most part, is now hunting down Tommy Doyle, played by a very young Paul Rudd, a young man tied to the legacy of the killer and his connections to the Strode family. As the supernatural elements of Michael's, uh, of Michael's abilities are explored, his longtime adversary, Dr. Sam Loomis, played, by, uh, played the final time by uh, Donald Pleasance, is also back in yet another attempt to stop the psychopath's brutal rampages. So, my history with the film is I've known about the, not so much all the history behind it, but I did know about the two different versions for a very long time. And it was. It, it, it kind of confused me, I'll be honest, because I was just like, well, like, like, the, like what, what is the point of there being two separate versions? And then I, I started doing research and uh, watching videos about the history of the film, and then I figured out why. So let's go into that history, shall we? So let's go into the production history of the film because it is certainly an interesting one. So it has been about five years, I would say, since the release of Halloween 5 when uh, production did start on the film. And kind of similar to Alien 3, actually, this film went through a lot of uh, different script revisions. Uh, from a number of different writers, but not as many as Alien 3, um, uh, fortunately. I think only two to three writers were in and out of the production to, finally, to you know, pen the drafts of the film 
for Dimension Films, who at this point had the rights to the Halloween franchise due to a buyout. And then, because I think it was between Dimension Films and New, uh, New Line Cinema, who obviously owned the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise and had just required the Friday the 13th series. So, and then, uh, unfortunately, Dimension Films got the rights to the Halloween franchise. Then they started work on the sixth film. And I don't remember all of the different concepts that they had for the, the film before we got the final draft. But all I know is that uh, during shooting... This film was obviously uh, kind of like Alien 3, again, was notorious for having new pages come in practically every day, and it was basically a shit show, where the director was not so much like David Fincher, but I think he was just more annoyed about the the, diff- the, the numerous script revisions coming in, like, what the hell is this? This wasn't what I agreed to. And, obviously, when they finished uh, filming, they, or when they got near the end of filming, they couldn't really decide on which, uh, or what the ending would possibly be for this film. So they finally, after a few weeks of trying to figure it out, they finally decide on one. But, obviously, that wasn't meant to stick, and they later, uh, Scrap the original ending and put in the ending that we have in the theatrical cut. But that ending for the original version did not go to waste. And I will get to that as the review goes on. But, yeah, it was shit. And I think another big reason why this film was kind of cursed from the start was the treatment of the character of Jamie Lloyd. Now... I don't know the exact details about it, but I'll try my best. And if I get any details wrong, anyone who has who knows the history behind Halloween 6 could easily correct me in the comment section. But, basically, uh, after Halloween 5 finished shooting, uh, Daniel Harris became very good friends with the Akkads, basically kind of asking, her, asking them throughout production of Halloween 5, and kind of into like a year or two later, was still asking them like, "Hey, when when's the next when's the next Halloween movie coming out?" Because she loved working on the fourth and fifth one so much. And then she kind of forgot about it for a few years, and then in 1994, something interesting came across her agent's desk, that being a casting call for someone similar to Danielle's description. Basically, what had happened was that uh, Dimension Films put out a... Basically, yeah, put out a casting call to have an actress replace Jamie Lloyd, or replace Daniel Harris as Jamie Lloyd, and even went to the weird extent of having a photograph of Daniel Harris in the... the, uh, uh, the contract itself to kind of be like, this is what she looks like. And obviously, there Daniel Harris was like, well, what the hell is this? So she was like, hey, I want to play Jamie Lloyd. And again, I'm, I'm not exactly familiar with the exact details of it, but basically the studio was like, okay, we'll give you the role. But you have to be emancipated from your family. Basically, that means giving, uh, like basically, uh, becoming like an adult and not having your parents, kind of, doing all the judgment for you. Let's say. So she, after a few weeks of kind of considering it and not, she finally decided to go through with it, and she was fully emancipated. Then she got the script. And if I said that she wasn't pleased by it, I would be severely be understating that one. She did not like the script and ordered a revision of the script with a uh, also asking for a IMDb says around a five thousand uh, dollar payment, uh, but 
basically in a, a huge amount of money to help uh, pay towards the the court fees that happened you know before and basically dimension said no piss off so uh, when she brought this up to uh, after consulting her family and friends and her agent she decided nah not gonna fucking do this and quit just days before production was set to begin so she obviously had to be replaced by let's see oh fuck did I actually not write it down um it should be on here somewhere right um fuck Wow, I'm I'm actually forgetting her name. This is not good. Um damn. But they they basically hired a new actress and basically for clarification, she was not involved with any of the Danielle Harris drama that was going on around that time. She had nothing to do with it. She was just brought in basically last minute to be like, okay, you're going to be playing Jamie Lloyd. And she had to get, I think, like brown contact lenses so that it looked more like Daniel Harris. Or it looked more like how she appeared in Halloween 5, but yeah. So that was one actor gone. But luckily they did manage to get Doc, uh, the Donald Pleasance. And... And they did shoot basically all of the scenes with him. But then they had to go and reshoot some stuff. But unfortunately, before they got uh, the test audience's uh, responses back on the original cut, Donald Pleasant did unfortunately pass away in early 1995. And that was, again, right before they decided to go with reshooting much of the third act so that kind of put them in the stalemate because they were like well what the hell are we gonna do so they basically hired a stunt double and um I had him basically replace Dr. Loomis for the uh for the reshoots and apparently, the initial research weren't the the initial research uh, reshoots weren't even enough because they had to go back and do another set of reshoots, which cost them even more money. And that finally led to the end product of the theatrical cut. Then, obviously, about so let's see, this was ninety, yeah, so September September ninety five. The we get the theatrical cut. It's a fucking mess. To most people. Then in about uh, mid, I would say mid 2000s, we get a rough work print version of the, um, of the, uh, of the, of the initial work print that was, uh, eventually relabeled as the producer's cut. And that was only circulating at, uh, VI bootlegs. That were basically just rips of the work print version that were pretty shit in quality. But in about, let's see, um, is he even going to say it on here? Probably not. Okay, uh, in about 2015, so about a decade later after the, uh, the producer's cut was, uh, initially released online, we finally got a physical release of it in 2015 on both DVD and Blu-ray. Now, the version I have here is the same as the regular Blu-ray, but is a is the uh, the VHS version that uh, Walmart sold in like 2018. So that's where we got that. But basically, yeah, it's the exact same version as the um, as the the 2015 Blu-ray and basically the original work print. So, yeah, really, nothing else different. My copy of the theatrical cut, on the other hand, is this Canadian three-film feature. And the reason why I don't have this, uh, because before, um, at the time that I got this, there, this was really, um, I guess might as well rope it in with this, with the history, 
that um, Hot Wing Six has had a very rough history on on Blu-ray. Not with that. So, I feel like the Halloween Six, the main problem with it was that it just kept on going out of print because Miramax is just a piece of shit company in terms of Blu-rays, and they like to license most of their stuff to Echo Bridge, which also makes shitty Blu-rays. And uh, this is actually a, a Canadian release, as you guys can tell by the back. Like, see, I'll, I'll compare it to the uh, the, uh, the the uncut version. You can see that you know this one obviously has the. Well, yeah, it says it says unrated, but it is like a, a U.S. Blu-ray, whereas this one only has wait, this one has the 18A Canadian rating right there. So yeah, but uh, this was rigid, and at least in terms of Blu-rays, as far as I know, this is the only way that we can get the Miramax trilogy um, in a in a good quality. And in the correct aspect ratio, I'll get more into depth about that with the H two O in, especially the H two O review, but also a little bit into the resurrection video. But like I said, the only real problem that that six had was just like it just kept on going out of print, and they didn't really. And when they did release it, they didn't really give any special features, like just having these bare bone releases. So it's not it's the same with this one, but. The the only problem I can really see with this release is that both Halloween Six and H two O are presented in ten eighty i, which is not the same as ten eighty p, which is what Resurrection is presented on this Blu ray. Basically, from what I can tell, ten eighty i is uh well, it's obviously Canadian's version of ten eighty p, but basically, it's no more better than I would say like. 480p so that was like my real concern is that the quality of this release would be really shit but surprisingly for 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 six it wasn't that bad uh but i i did wish that i had the 4k's which i i am asking for my birthday that may i may do an update on my birthday about the 4k releases and just have like a general update on just the review of six that that may happen, but I, that's not confirmed. But anyway, so this was uh, basically my only way of watching the theatrical version, and it turned out to be very well in the end, while also having you know the uh, high res version of the producer's cut as well. So let's go into both versions and see which one turned out to be the better one, the theatrical or the producer's cut. Let's start off obviously with the theatrical cut. All right, so before we go fully into depth with the theatrical cut, let's go over the cast and then we can go into uh, specifics. So we obviously have Dr. Pleasance playing Dr. Samuel Lewis for the final time. And I do like him more in this film than in the than in Halloween Five because in this film you just feel more more sympathetic towards him than in Halloween Five where he just seems like a crazy old man trying to hunt down Michael Myers. So, yeah, it's it's a very very humble performance, and I I am glad that he did return to the Halloween franchise to kind of cap off his you know. Uh, his character but uh it just is a shame what they did with him which we'll get to in a little bit we have a uh, the a very young paul rudd as tommy doyle this was technically his first feature film debut uh even though uh he did get signed on to clueless during the production of this film which actually got released before this film this is technically his feature film debut and he would later go on to say that in like after the film came out in like the mid 2000s when he gave interviews he just said that he was basically disgusted by this film and like didn't like it at all but in recent years he was more i would say more open and more liking that his first film was a halloween film and he did express interest into returning as the character 
And I think he was even asked to return as the character in last year's Halloween Kills. But he... Those... This fucking Marvel movie just kept on coming out. So, obviously, he was tied up in that, so they couldn't get him for Halloween Kills. But in this film, eh, he pulls off a very weird performance. He's very... It seems... He seems like a robot to me. That's what it seems like. And it it's very, very... It's a very weird performance, and I feel like that it could have been done better. But, yeah. We have uh, Mitchell Ryan as Dr. Terrence Wynn. And, uh, I think, uh, Joe Chappelle actually did see him in uh, Lethal Weapon. And it was like, th th this is the perfect guy for Wynn. And he obviously got casted, and I won't reveal his, uh, what happens to his character, as of now, uh, I'll I'll go a little bit more into depth about it in this section, and then uh, as well as in the uh, my section about the producer's cut. But in the theatrical cut, they just waste him, and I'll get to that later. We also have a uh, uh, Monroe Hogan or Hagen as Kara Strode. She is fine. She's nothing really that special. But she does fine with the material that she's given. We have uh, Kim Darby as Deborah Strode and um, uh, uh, Bradford English as John Strode, who are kind of like the two parents. Deborah is alright, but John is just too much of a dick for me to care about him. We have a uh, Mariah O'Brien as Beth and uh, Keith Bargert, or Bargot as or no, Bogert, Bogert as uh, Tim Strode, and they both are fine. But it's kind of like the same issue with um, with the teens in Halloween Five, where it's just like, all right, you're dead, you're dead. The two parents are dead. You couple, you few are, you you few are gonna stay alive, but the rest of these fucks are dead. So, and that's kind of the, the 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 weakest part about this film is the characters, because yeah, they, they are un, unlike Halloween Five. There are some that I actually do want to root for, but either besides Doctor Loomis, they are either underdeveloped, gen, uh, the generic ass characters like basically all the teens and the two parents, either underdeveloped like. Kara Strode and uh, Danny Strode, played by Devin Gardner, or they are just the acting is just weird, like Tommy jo uh, Tommy Doyle. I almost said Tommy Joggers from a uh, fucking Friday the Thirteenth, but but yeah, besides besides Loomis, there it's all just kind of weird. It's just a weird hodgepodge of just stereotypes, underdeveloped and weird acted characters, and it's just. I, I don't connect with it, but there is Dr. Loomis who does kind of try to carry his role, uh, try to carry uh, he, they just the, the film through, even though they don't really use him well in the film, like, which, again, I'll get to in a little bit. And then we have, um, we technically have two Michael Myers for this film. The main one is George P. Wilbur, who returns from Halloween 4, and he does... It is good again with the Michael Myers performance, but with the uh, obviously they had to get the reshoots done, and they wanted a thinner Michael Myers, so they uh, they hired a, a Michael Lerner as a basically. If you want to see kind of the differences, if you really can, basically the watch the entire, like basically just watch the theatrical cut, and basically up until. Basically, a good comparison, would, I guess, would be watch, like, the house scenes um, right before the third act. That's George P. Wilbur. And then once we get into, like, the... Once we get to Smith's Girl Sanatorium in the theatrical cut, that's basically all a Michael Lerner. Ne nearly all of it, pretty much. Although, George P. Wilbur does all, also does get, like, a tiny little cameo as one of the doctors who does get kind of brutally murdered, which... 
I'll get to later. Or actually, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it right now because now we're going to be talking about the kind of the differences between the two versions. So we have um, uh, the, the theatrical cut has more of like a, a warmer tone, uh, which obviously must have been done in the post production because right, I'll get that more into that one later. But uh, the music, on the other hand, was um, kind of weird. It's mostly now just replaced with like generic, either generic rock music or a rock version of the, the Halloween theme. And it doesn't work at all. I really hate the score to the theatrical cut. And along with the score, I fucking hate the transitions in the theatrical cut. They are just... They, they're basically just trying to give you a, a, a fucking seizure. Because it, it's like flashing lights along with intercut like scenes of like either Michael slashing someone or just random shots throughout the film. And it's just stupid and dumb. Uh, Dr. Loomis gets... Like, he is basically wasted in the theatrical cut because they cut out most of the scenes from the original version. And that causes him to be kind of... Like I said, useless. Doctor Wynn barely pops up in the entire movie, so his reveal as spoilers, you know, obviously that's the beginning of every my reviews, but spoilers, when he gets revealed as the man in black in the theatrical cut, it doesn't feel like anything because you barely you barely know him, you don't know what he's you know about. So when you get revealed to him, when he's revealed to be the man in black, you're just like, well, what the hell? Like, there was no build-up to that. They barely introduced his character. They barely did anything with him. And now we're supposed to believe that he was the man in black the entire time? Bullshit. And like I said, the the entire third act is just kind of weird, even though I actually do kind of like the theatrical cut better. I feel like that it does... as a, It does have a better story flowing throughout it in terms of the producer's cut... But we'll get to that one. Overall, I think... Besides the third act, I think overall... The... Like, the last 15 minutes are actually pretty kind of good. And I will admit, when I was watching these... The, because I watched both of these versions back-to-back. -back. I saw obviously started with the theatrical and went on to the producer's cut. When I was watching the theatrical cut, I'm not gonna lie. Within the, the first 10 minutes... I was kind of enjoying myself. I was like, damn, this is actually kind of better than Halloween 5. But as the film went on, it went from good to average, and then from average to just plain shit. Until the last, like, 15 minutes, until they kind of brought it back up. But overall, it was still... Now that I've seen both versions, like, one after the other, and now I just hate the theatrical cut more and more. Because it cuts out so many important scenes and just makes the entire film kind of redundant. Which I'll get to more when I'm talking about the producer's cut and the uh, to my final thoughts. But yeah, overall I just think that the 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 theatrical cut is a is a mess and it's very difficult to try and work your way around it. Also, it's really kind of gory for, especially for a micro, for for a Halloween movie. It's kind of overly gory. I feel like that the best death in the entire film um, is actually the death of the father, John Strode. Where basically, it it's kind of the same in both versions. Where um, he he goes down to the basement, finds like the bloody clothes. And then he turns around and he sees Michael there, where in the and then in the theatrical cut he gets stabbed and he gets like electric and you see like all like the uh like the kind of like the foam like kind of pussing out of his mouth and then his fucking head just explodes, like that I was that was probably the only like real moment I was like yay that that was actually kind of cool whereas the rest of them they were just like unnecessarily more gory, and it's just uh... overall I. Obviously, if you're a diehard Halloween fan, you've probably already seen both versions, but if I 
if I had to recommend this particular version to a casual fan, I wouldn't because it's just, it's incohesive, it's, it's practically a shit show with, you know, good Dr. Loomis scenes, but he's practically wasted throughout the entire film because they cut out most of his scenes for the theatrical version, and that makes, like, what, we have to, we root for Tommy Jarvis now? Or no, Tommy, Tommy Doyle, but then he's, like, acting like a robot. Do we root for Kara? And, well, he, she's kind of bland as a character, so do we really? And then every other... And then Danny is just like, well, he's just a kid. I, I, don't, I don't really know. And then everyone else is like, you're dead. You're dead. She dies. <laughs> you die. Like, it's just cannon fodder. So overall, I do not like the theatrical cut, even though... I I really do kind of like the ending and how they were like okay well we don't have Donald Pleasance anymore what's let's make this let's make this end let's make it a finale whereas obviously the producer's cut was filmed before his death and was made to kind of be like let's set up another sequel which we'll get to right now so let's move on to the producer's cut Okay, so let's move on to the producer's cut, which, like I mentioned earlier in the uh, production history, was lost to, uh, was lost for a number of years until the original work print did pop up online, and then obviously we did get an official release. So this includes almost seventy minutes of alternate, unedited footage, as well as an alternate ending. So, yeah, let's go over the differences. There is, uh, I actually do have um, a notes here, that uh, a, there is a different title card at the beginning, whereas in the theatrical cut, it's like Halloween and big fun, and then it's very tiny, uh, the curse of Michael Myers. The producer's cut open, like it does like a, it comes from like kind of like behind us, and then like gets smaller into frame. And obvious, um, actually, is it? No, it's not. Um, the um, the A in the in Halloween is actually the mark of thorn, which sets up its more its bigger connection or its bigger its bigger uh, uh, kind of like uh, appearance in this version of the story. Uh, we have. We have a couple more shots of uh, of uh, the Man in Black after Jamie has given birth. Uh, we also have uh, a flashback to the ending of Halloween 5 where when the Man in Black sh uh, breaks Michael out. Well, we have this weird voice in the background saying like, Jamie, come to me. And then we have a new, sh a new shot of Michael getting loaded into the back of a van by the cult and uh, Jamie getting captured as well. Then once um, once uh, Jamie starts to escape along with the nurse, we have an extra shot of Michael's feet walking up to this door and opening up and then him walking through, which I was like, oh, that, that's actually kind of cool. Uh, we have more of the Halloween theme in this version compared to the theatrical cut, which was either like I say, either the grungy rock or the or a rock version of the Halloween theme. This one goes straight for the original Halloween theme and uses cues from the original film as basically the entire soundtrack. Where I was like, okay, I, I do applaud you for actually using the original score, but around like the halfway point, I was like, okay, this is getting this is getting tiring now. And that's basically the entire score. It's just cues of like the the from either the Halloween theme itself or like um like like a certain cue from I think it's like Laurie's theme from the original film. Uh the truck driver's death the truck driver truck driver's death is less scored in the producer's cut where it's just a simple neck snap. Whereas the theatrical cut they reshot it to have it like more open veins and blood squirting out. Um uh, Jamie gets um, instead of getting murdered in the barn like she does in the theatrical cut on like a, a hay bale like uh, grinder thing she just gets stabbed by Michael in the gut 
And then we have that shot of in both versions where he goes into the truck and finds that rolled towel. And she actually does survive his uh, her encounter with Michael in the barn compared to the theatrical where she obviously does get killed off. And uh, we cut, when we cut to uh, Kara and uh, Danny, there's a nice little moment where she... Um, she, uh, Kara does this, like, a little ritual to, like, stay away monsters, stay away ghosts. I was like, hey, well, like, why wasn't that in the theatrical version? That, that would have helped. Um, we have, uh, more scenes at, uh, Dr. Loomis's home where he explains that he had basically plastic, uh, plastic surgery to remove the, uh, the scar on his cheek and his hand. So that, like, from the previous two films. So I was like, hey, you know. This film does make a, a nice, makes more attempts to connect it with the previous films than the theatrical cut. Which I do like. Then we have uh, one more, Jamie has one more flashback while she's in the hospital. To um, uh, basically imply that she was. Okay, this is actually one part that I do, I do not like about the producer's cut compared to the theatrical. Whereas... It's never really, grandly, in the theatrical cut, they did, they don't really say how Jamie has a baby. And they subtly apply it in the, the third act where she, uh, they kind of explain that, like, oh, it was like a test two baby sort of thing. Or, uh, like, it was like, uh, like an artificial uh, baby. But the producer's cut makes it clear cut that she was basically raped by her psycho uncle and it obviously it's never full out explained but there are shots in this flashback where it is very much implied that it it was michael's kid and that just oh god it, it, it still does not sit well on my mind at all <coughs> um John's death is also less gory in the producer's cut where like I said in the, the in the uh, theatrical version he gets uh stabbed into like the, the generator box and like uh f like foam is like falling out of his mouth and then his fucking head explodes whereas in the producer's cut he just gets stabbed like he, he well, in both versions, he gets, he gets stabbed and shoved onto the electrical box, but in the producer's guy, he just gets electrocuted, and then we get one shot of, like, this hilarious fake dummy, because you can tell it's fake, because, like, the head's, like, really small compared to the actor's actual head, but, yeah, he just gets, like, stabbed and electrocuted, whereas the theatrical version, obviously, his fucking head explodes, so he's like, yeah, he ain't coming back from this one. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the entire last act is different in the uh, producer's cut compared to the theatrical. Where basically, Kara, instead of waking up in like a prison cell kind of thing, she wakes up on a slab similar to how Jamie uh, was put onto a slab at uh, when she was uh, captured by the cult. We also then have a... Um, the scene between Wynn and Loomis is different, where in the theatrical cut, he's just more in like a, like a suit kind of thing. Whereas the producer's cut, he's in like his full throne, uh, thorn outfit and goes more into depth about um, uh, like what, what the purpose is of you know, the, the child and stuff like that. Then we, ha we basically have an entire th uh, thorn uh, ceremony scene that Tommy kind of spies in on. He... Then infiltrate. Like, he puts on the suit, grabs the dagger, and pull and holds Win hostage, which is saying, "Untie her, get the baby, and Danny leave. We're going." And obviously, Michael. I hate the fact that Michael is just kind of just sitting there in the corner, just not doing anything. Like, what the fuck? No, you're supposed to be killing people, like for fuck's sake. And then once they escape, no joke. The ending to, to the producer's cut is. Tommy remembers that he has, like, all these ruins, or these ruins in his, uh, in, like, this, like, little sack. So he brings them out, he puts them in a circle, then, like, cuts his hand with the dagger, spills blood on the floor. Then once uh, Michael's reached him, he grabs him by the throat, and Tommy says, like, uh, I forgot the fucking word that he says, but he's like, uh, and he says the word. And then 
Michael just stops. Like, like the ruins stopped him. It's like, that's bullshit. At least in the theatrical, it's somewhat more... It's somewhat more believable where they, like, implant him with, like, drugs and then beat him to death with a pipe. When it's like, okay, that one's... Yeah, obviously that's not that much better either, but at least it's somewhat better than him getting stopped by fucking stones. Then in the... At least we get, like, a, like a an explanation that is like, yeah, the ruins stopped Michael. So it's like, okay, at least that somewhat clar- clarifies it instead of just being like, oh, let's believe this ambiguous. Then... Uh, Dr. Wynn walks up to Michael and is like, Michael, what like, what did they do to you? And then, obviously, he doesn't say, like, the, the clenched fist. And then, there's there's a couple more lines of dialogue between uh, Tommy and Loomis right before the, the combo fuss line, which makes it more kind of flow well instead of in the theatrical cut where it's just more just, like, abrupt and it's just, like, the combo fuss Loomis. And then, once they leave, he does walk back into the, uh, uh, walks back into the institution and finds Michael laying on the floor. Now, this is the, the biggest difference. Whereas, uh, the ending, the actual ending to the theatrical cut, yeah, Michael gets beat to death with a pipe, and then Loomis says, like, yeah, I got some business to attend to. Then once, we actually get a shot in the theatrical of them driving out of the, of the, uh, institution. Then we cut to the mask, this is the room that Michael was beaten to death in. And then we, we pan down to a shot of the mask laying on the ground with a needle. And then Dr. Loomis screaming, which was taken from the producer's cut. Which I'm like, that was kind of shit. But not as bad as the fucking producer's cut. Because basically what happens is that Loomis walks into the, in, in, back to where Michael was. He's laying on the ground. Loomis removes the mask off of Michael. And it's Dr. Wynn. Who, I'm assuming got either, yeah, he probably, yeah, he did get knocked out by, by Michael, and then they, uh, he put the costume on him, and then he grabs Loomis' arm, and he's like, it's your game now, Loomis, and then he just fucking dies, apparently, and then Loomis looks at his wrist, and sees, no fucking joke, the thorn symbol magically appear on his wrist. What? What? And then we hear the scream that he gives out in the theatrical. Uh, it's, it's actually a shot of him like holding his wrist, and he just starts like, like, I guess like screaming in pain. And then we cut to a shot of what we think is the man in black outfit, but we see Michael's burned hand and his boots basically, basically fall out, saying that yeah, Michael knocked out uh, Wing and swapped uh, outfits so that he would be laying on the ground in the Michael outfit. And then he can continue on his murder spree. And yeah. That's pretty much about it. What do I think about the producer's cut? It's slightly better than the theatrical version. But not by much. It's it's a vague, vague improvement over the theatrical Honestly, I feel like that this was kind of like an Alien 3 thing where it's like it, this film is kind of fucked. Whereas Alien 3, it, it seemed more like it was a good idea that got shit canned. This film, it was just fucked right from the beginning. And no matter which version you watch, or I'll, get, I'll get more into that later. But needless to say, the producer's cut is a slightly better version than the theatrical. Even though I think that the ending overall is better in the theatrical than in the producer's cut. Uh, but overall, I think that the producer's cut is an overall better film, uh, by a very small margin, which is, I'm going to give the producer's cut a straight D, not, and the, I'm going to give the theatrical a D minus. Hoo boy! That was a lot. But we're not done yet. Let's go into the final thoughts, shall we? Okay, so now we reach the final stretch of the review, where basically, the I was gonna go over the both of the fun facts, but the second one I had was about the whole Daniel Harris thing, which I mentioned during the production part. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't actually mention this part, but might as well get into it right now. 
then we're gonna go into the soundtrack and then my final thoughts so um the writer of halloween sex daniel farins um uh after uh during production uh jokingly put in the title uh put in the subtitle the curse of michael myers as an in joke of the production basically being cursed Although the, the prank had kind of backfired on him because the producers were like, hey, that actually sounds pretty good for this movie. Let's, let's change up the subtitles so that I can be cursed with Michael Myers. And now we're stuck with this bullshit of a fucking subtitle. And I think it's also worth mentioning right now before we get on to the, um, the final part is that this is the first Halloween film to not have an actual number following the halloween name it's just halloween the curse of michael myers although for the title of this video i am going to put it as halloween six to kind of make it make more sense um but yeah basically on you can even tell on the title right the spot right here it just says halloween the curse of michael myers and yeah even on here and even when you look up halloween six it's most likely going to pop up with just Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers, and I just think that's a bit weird. Then we move on to the score, which has a, a bit of a history of its own. Basically, the um, Alan Howard returned again to do the score for this film, but when he finished the score, the producers didn't really like it that much, so they cut out a huge chunk of it and had like a music editor come in and do not only re-edits to the score, but also add new pieces of music to the original soundtrack to make the final... Well, also adding uh, contemporary rock songs that were made by well-known artists to the film's soundtrack to get the overall final soundtrack that we have for the theatrical cut. And obviously a completely different score for the producer's cut. Now... There was an original album release that was coincide that released coincided with the film's release, but I think that only included like a couple of tracks from the film, and the rest was like the pop songs that were uh, pop and rock songs that appeared throughout the film. But in 2012, Alan Howard did release an expanded version of the soundtrack, which has both complete soundtracks on the thing itself. Disc one includes the uh, the score to the producer's cut, and disc two includes the score to the theatrical cut now i don't know how much a physical version goes online but luckily uh you can listen to this through uh vi streaming like um like uh apple music i know it has it on spotify and um i'm pretty sure youtube music has it as well so if you want to stream it and not pay a stupid amount of money to get an original cd release of the expanded soundtrack Go ahead and stream it. It's probably the best way to do it anyway. Anyway, I think that's that about covers everything. So, final thoughts on the curse of Michael Myers. It's shit. Overall, both versions are not good movies at all. If I had to recommend one overall, I would have to say the producer's cut. Even though the ending is pretty fucking weird and bullshit. Compared to the theatrical cut, which makes somewhat more sense. The theatrical cut cuts out a lot of plot-significant stuff. Which overall makes it very incoherent to, you know, to follow. Whereas the producer's cut does establish things a lot more. And overall makes it a much more pleasant watching experience. But, honestly, either both versions are not good movies at all. And to a casual viewer, I do not recommend this film at all. Although, obviously, if you're a major Halloween fan, you have probably already seen both versions. But, I mean, if granted, you don't really have to take my opinion. If you want to watch the movies, that's great. But I'm just saying, warn yourselves. If, if you want to watch both versions, you will be diving into shit. And I do mean you are, you are going to be diving into some shit. Anyway, that was my review on Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. I hope you guys enjoyed this year's Halloween special. I don't know if I will be returning next year, considering the fact that Season 7 I have planned out is going to be very different from any other, series, any other season 
a Russell movie review is that I've done. So we'll see about that one. I may have to skip next year entirely because of what I have planned for season seven. But in terms of when my next review is, I don't know really. I'm still trying to figure that one out. But um, if I had to make a rough guess, a, a rough guess, I just say maybe expect at least one review within the next month or two. I can. I should probably at least have one out by then. If not, I am truly sorry. But I am truly running out of movies to talk about, and you know it. It comes to the point where I'm probably gonna have to be doing a lot of. Uh, reduxes which is fine because i do want to improve a lot of my earlier work uh so that gives me a lot more time to actually kind of work on reduxes but yeah i will i'm gonna say this right now expect reviews to be a lot more slower uh for this season uh but season seven there will be probably a lot more consistent we'll find out but in terms of it an, another video that may come at some point within the next few months. I would certainly say just keep watch for new videos. I wouldn't necessarily say they're going to be movie reviews. Um, but do keep do keep an eye because I will be posting videos every once in a while. But um, yeah, uh, as usual, uh, if you like this sort of content, make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon to get notified when future videos are coming out. I am still trying to hit 150 subscribers by the end of the year. If we can get that, that would mean the world to me. So please do make sure to subscribe. Also, follow me on my social media pages, my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Those will be all down in the description below and at the end card. And uh, also throw, follow me on my Twitch page because I will be doing some live streams every once in a while. Also, follow me on my throne page too if you guys want to help that a little extra more. Uh, make sure to follow there and maybe buy a gift every once in a while that would surely help this channel out and if you want to you know just give that a little extra support it's not obviously mandatory but if you want to you know get that sp little special recognition by yours truly you can also do that as well i will leave a link down in the description below to the um to you know some videos about going into the behind this more into depth about the behind the scenes stuff and the different versions so uh also check those ones out too so yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video and uh stay tuned for whenever the next one is because i generally do not know but hope you guys had a very nice halloween i sure did and stay tuned for the next video whenever that is live long and prosper out